Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Versus Stars Podcast. How my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Ryan North boards the mothership. He's the writer of Fantastic Four from Marvel Comics. Come boards, we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. North. Thank you so much for coming to Versus Stars Podcast. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So my pleasure. So I always start off with the question of inspiration. So what inspired your love of comics and who are your earliest influences? Oh, um, I grew up in a, a small village outside of Ottawa that didn't have a comic book store. And so my love of comics was abstract for a really long time. Uh, I sort of had this vague idea that I like them. Like I like hmm. Superman, you know, I like Batman. And I grew up, graduated high school, got a job before university. And I remember my first paycheck, I drove to the comic book store in Ottawa and just started like buying comic books at random. Um, and they were really good. I bought three books that first paycheck and I loved two of them. <laughs> and two or three is a really good, really good uh, record for that. So I guess I came to it late, but it was something that I always suspected I enjoyed and was uh, happy to see that that was proven true. <laughs> So which two were, were the ones that you liked? They were, and this is like randomly off the shelf. I just grabbed books I thought looked interesting. It was uh, the Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller, Klaus Johnson, and uh, Superman Peace on Earth, which is a almost a picture book about Superman trying to cure world hunger uh, oh. by Paul Dini and Alex Ross. And like Dark Knight Returns obviously is this uh, very important book in sort of pushing the superhero genre forward. And Superman Peace on Earth, I love because here was a book that was taking Superman very seriously and giving him a, a very rounded problem. Like Superman has all these powers. Like, why do I not simply solve world hunger? I should be able to do this. And he tries and he fails. Ooh. And seeing a comic where Superman failed, but still having to be like this really uplifting story. And again, like seeing Alex Ross's art for the first time uh on interiors and these gorgeous oversized pages i was like man there is a lot more to comics than what i may have suspected <laughs> and i still feel that way it's such a a young medium and such a versatile medium that you know you can read a comic and see something done in the form that you haven't seen done before mm. which is rare in other art forms but almost routine in comics you know that's kind of fascinating when you're um the idea of we just said about superman trying to um solve world hunger because you think you know as powerful as superman is that feels like a problem bigger like it was too big for him considering yeah. just i mean how do you even approach <laughs> feeding eight billion people i mean did what, what what did he attempt to do just like speed of light running to everybody all the time uh one of the more memorable scenes is he picks up a giant ship of grain that's been donated by the un and he tries to bring it to this uh war-torn country run by a despot and the guy fires missiles at the grain to blow it up because he'd rather his people starve than be in debt to this western imperialist mm. and there's this great shot of superman on his knees in the dirt like holding this now poison grain in his hands and being like okay there's there's more to this than i thought <laughs> like there's a political situation around this is not just this isn't the bottom line is this, this is not a problem he can punch right and uh or shoot laser beams at and it's so interesting, I think, when you take these characters with these incredible powers, you think, you know, the, the classic complaint about Superman is he's too powerful, he can do anything. And there's so much he can't do. There's so much that these powers do not help him with. Right. And he has to either find some way around it or, you know, live with that. <laughs> I mean, that is so true. Like, that, that's a fascinating problem that I give to Superman. Because, I mean, there, I, I, I've heard a story. I remember the, it was a news story some years back. I can't, I'm at the age now. I can't remember this. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it also kind of feels like <laughs> the same amount of time at this point. Uh, and, the, and there was like a, uh, this issue where food is, was donated that was, I think, genetically modified food. Uh, so it'd mm -hmm. be bigger and grow it um, and sent to so, some of these poor nations to feed. But they didn't trust the food because it was genetically modified. So they wouldn't give it. And I thought to myself, what a weird problem. And so, it's super, like Superman, once again, it's not just the food that is there, which is it's not enough of it to get around. But there's so much more involved in cultural issues and religious issues, all this political other stuff. Issue. Political yep, issues. Political yep, issues. Yep. It's like, yeah, I, I guess that would be something that I assume you're just like, 
damn. I, I'm just, I, I just can't solve this. This is one problem I'm just yeah. stuck without. But Superman is also the guy who is always going to do what's right and always going to, you know, try really hard to not let anyone down. And it's so interesting to put a guy like that against a problem like that, where the problem right. is really human nature. Right. <laughs> and he's not a human. Like he's, he's an alien. It, I mean, I know we're, we're talking a lot with this, but people should really check out peace on earth. Uh, Paul Dini, Alex Ross. Great, great comic. Look, change your life. It did mine. And for the listeners who may not know the name Paul Dini, I feel like he's way better known of, of what he's done than necessarily the name itself. For those who don't know, he's one of the great minds behind the Batman animated series. Um, so even if you don't necessarily know the name of what he's done in the world comics, he's probably dead. He's very famous in the world superhero for what he's accomplished and what he's uh, where we are now is a lot because of yeah. what he's done in the uh, in the Timverse. So for those who don't you know, have read he's fantastic. Stuff and loved it. Yeah. Right. If you don't know his name, you've read stuff that he's written and loved it. If you like Harley Quinn, I'm pretty sure remember sir, is Harley Quinn is Paul Denny is in my memory yep. stars on that one yep. correctly. So yeah, you once again you may not know that's only the name, but you've known everything he's done. So yeah. <laughs> so as someone who's now a comic book writer, um having read some of comic books, Peace on Earth and these other things, do stories like that impact how you think about writing your stories going forward? Oh for sure. For sure. I think uh, any writer wants to do better than everything he's ever read. <laughs> and it's hard and usually impossible. But knowing that these are the kind of stories you can tell, like when I'm writing a issue of Fantastic Four, and they're mainly standalone issues, so I'm coming up with a lot of standalone short stories, a lot of premises. Um, I often think of, you know, what is, what can they do this month? And there's no limits on that. I don't have to have them punch a guy until he stops doing crime or like go to space and punch some aliens until they stop doing crime. Like there's, there's stories you can tell with these characters that go beyond the genre in which they were created. Like when you're going back to the first Superman stories, he was not created to be a character who is going to solve world hunger. He's created to be a, a, a justice character for the downtrodden who's going to punch crooked landlords and crooked cops. Mm. And these characters have such flexibility and such, such depth after, you know, sometimes literal decades of people writing them and pouring their hearts into them that when you get the chance to write them, all you can really do is try to live up to that and not feel like you're constrained by the box that these characters were originally packaged in. Because especially with the Fantastic Four, I was posting on, on online today, like these characters can do anything. Like mm. they are incredibly flexible. Uh, you can drop them into different scenarios and you've got a rock guy, a fire guy, a stretchy guy, an invisible woman, but these characters can do so much more than just what their powers suggest. It's mm. really remarkable, I think, how much, I guess, verb is in these people. <laughs> well, Fantastic Four are one of the, I mean, there's some characters that fit certain boxes, like Green Arrow, kind of like this urban hero kind of thing. He's not going to mm -hmm. make work as well flying in space it's just not where a character goes spider-man had been has been cosmic but for the most part he's again fighting criminals at the street yeah. level um but i do think that fantastic four has it's sort of like green lantern in which their scope is almost infinite um street level if they want to be space if they want to be ultra interdimensional travelers if they want to be um subterranean apparently if they want to be so yeah, I, with, these are these are people who have like gone to space they've literally met god and they also stopped bank robbers right <laughs> anywhere in between <laughs> so is that I, I on some level i think as a writer the freedom is amazing but is it some when you're thinking is it sometimes too much potential that you like do you feel need like i need to focus more on this kind of story or that kind of like what makes in your mind then the a fantastic four story when where when are they at their best yeah uh, that's that's a very hard question <laughs> <laughs> Um, the thing that's more unique about the Fantastic Four is that they were created and exist as superheroes, Marvel's first family. But you can tell so many stories where they're not actually doing superhero stuff. They're more just explorers. And mm. my whole pitch for the book was I had this image in my head of four weirdos roll into town with a problem. They fix the problem and they leave. <laughs> and that's sort of a narrative engine that works really well for the Fantastic Four because they are four weirdos and they do yeah. want to help. And 
it can literally be a small town or it could just be conceptually a small town. They come across some problem in space or wherever and they're there to help. And it was only after writing like six or seven issues where I was like, you know, this is actually uh, structurally really close to sort of the original series Star Trek where you have the, this weird mm. crew show up and there's some problem on a planet and they fix the problem, they go on to the next thing. <laughs> and it's, it's, I think it's really satisfying to read. It's, I kind of prank myself. It's also very hard to write. I was coming off of uh, my last big run was on Squirrel Girl for Marvel. Mm. And there we did four issue arcs. So it was every, you know, five, four or five months I have to think of a new story. Then I spent all this time writing it. Now I'm doing a new story every month and I love reading it, but it's a lot harder to write. Right. You know, what, what kind of, I think like almost tonally, the closest, um, the, the closest um, story that I think from a tonal standpoint in comics right now, it's sort of what Jeremy Adams was doing in The Flash for a while, where mm. it's definitely, you know, it's a little lighter in tone and very family driven. And fast forward it feels like it's very family character driven versus let's say something like Batman, which is more like ominous, dark, you know, serious kind of every every issue, the world's about to end. I feel like this is a slightly more family, little light, more lighthearted. Um in your mind, how much of the element is this character family aspect? Um, it's funny. I was talking to uh, another writer friend of mine, Chip Zdarsky, uh, a while back. And we're like saying like, what's our weakest strength? Like, what are we so bad at that we, we just don't, are not good at as a writer. And I was saying, man, you know, I can do dialogue, but I'm, I, I'm no good at character. Like mm. I hate character. And then I've realized since then that that's like crazy because <laughs> everything <laughs> I do is character based. Like, <laughs> what I hate actually was like trying to come up with a character from scratch, like trying to invent a whole person. That's hard. That takes time. But mm. For something like Fantastic Four, where these characters, you know, sixty years old, they've 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 been well established, most of them for years and years and years. The challenge was not how to admit this character. The challenge was how do I understand these people? Mm. And once you know these people who they are, you can tell the stories around that. And so for me, uh, one of the reasons the characters were broken up in the first four issues was it gave me a month with a couple characters. Like it's been a month with Johnny, a month with Reed and Sue, a month with Ben and Alicia, and really nail the voice, really know who these people are. So when they do come together. The readers know who they are and also i know who they are mm. and so character the relationships are at the core of this but when i'm telling a story when i'm trying to think of a new one i don't sit down and say what's a relationship i want to examine i think of what's a cool sci-fi plot like what what's some crazy thing that could happen and then what does that do to the characters so mm. to answer your question i think i start by learning the characters and that's just like the homework that's the background and then once you have the characters i start with a premise a plot something cool that happens and then using the characters i now understand tell the story with that so it's central in two different ways well and the other thing about the finesse for is too is that they've had a really interesting history in marvel um just historically as comic book characters um they've been at the forefront especially near the beginning when obviously as the first superhero coming out of marvel mm -hmm. they've faded into the background in other um, years and decades uh, where the stories series what didn't even exist for some years um mm -hmm. how do you make them again characters that exist at the forefront of marvel of the marvel universe i think the challenge with the fantastic four is that they have been around um longer than i've been alive and when you have characters that old you can have this reputation of like oh these are you know these are your father's superheroes or your grand mm. your grandmother's superheroes like these characters not relevant which to me is wild because there's nothing wrong with these characters like they're great mm. And so sort of my whole deal with the book was let's make a comic that feels fresh and accessible. Let's mm. have it feel like this is a comic that's launching today, 2023 or 2022 when it came out. Um, they're still the same people. The adventures they had still happened, but you don't need to have read 60 years of comics to enjoy it. And you don't need, we're not abandoning it. It's still there. We can do reference to it, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be a barrier. It's got to be something that that's accessible, and for me, that's that's the the whole heart of it. Is that if we want the Fantastic Four to be cool, if we want them to be popular, if we want their, we want people to love them, then we have to be able to put a Fantastic Four comic in someone's hand and say, "Read this. It's cool. You'll enjoy it." And they can jump in feet first and not be lost. So recap pages are great for that, but also structuring stories so that if you've read six years of comics, 
you enjoy it and you get the deep cuts. If you haven't, you're not confused. It still reads perfectly fine for you. And that's, mm. that's my philosophy behind it is like, let's make it accessible and through that, allow it to grow, allow it to be something that there is no price to admission. You don't have to, there's no test. There's no, mm. there's no deep knowledge you need to have. You can still enjoy it like anyone else. That's the hope. It's, <laughs> it's always hard, right? To, to walk that line. But that's especially, what I'm aiming for. Well, especially the timing is interesting as well. Because I mean, obviously, you know, every, every Marvel fan, uh, fan knows that in the world of movies, which is, um, you know, kind of what's shaking the industry right now, uh, moving, shaking the industry, is that Fantastic Four is moving quickly towards appearing now in the Marvel Universe. Um, we're, we're hearing things about casting. I don't think it's been official yet. Um, it's definitely moving along. Um, obviously, Disney is in some ways almost movie first now because of the amount of money you make in a movie versus what you make in the comic book industry at the mm-hmm. moment. Has there been anything where editorial has told you we need to focus on this as this is upcoming or please don't touch this. We're going to, this is going to impede what we're trying to get towards a movie. Is there any um, connection or association between what you're doing and what the movie side of the world is trying to do with fans for going forward? Yeah, no, there's been no restrictions at all. And I think uh, I'm, I'm really glad that I can say that because I feel like, to me and maybe not to the rest of like american culture but to me Mm -hmm. comics is not a lesser medium it's not something that goes beneath movies in terms of potential or prestige or anything and so i wouldn't want to be writing a book where something that was happening in a functionally unrelated film would restrict what we can do Mm. what i would want is to write a book that's so awesome and be like man i I should check out the movie and see if it lives up to this you know that's, (laughs) that's the goal so uh, I'm glad they're making a movie. I'm, I'm excited to see it, but I don't know what's happening in it. And neither have I ever been told you can't do this because X, Y, Z is going to happen in this film. They're, they're in completely different wheelhouses. So the other cool thing is, uh, we'll see, it's a beautiful looking comic book. It's the artist by Ivan. Am I- Aban Coelho. Aban Coelho. Aban. So yeah. is this something, is this a team up that, uh, that has already, that you helped put together? Do they say, hey, this is your artist? And if, you haven't worked together in the past. How do you approach working with an artist then that you don't know? Yeah, we had never worked together before. Uh, this was a Marvel blind date situation. <laughs> and uh, so when, when I found out if I was going to be drawing the book, I was like, oh, this is really cool. This is exciting. And I emailed them and same thing I always do is I say, what do you, what do you like to draw? And what do you hate to draw? And uh Obama was great she's like I, I like everything I especially like fight scenes and I was like well you're working in the right genre <laughs> <laughs> there will be one in every issue we can do this <laughs> um and it's it's really that like we're we're all professionals uh you hope to form a working relationship where you're friends and you can just have that easy rapport but even if you're like the two most opposite people in the world and in real life you would hate each other um, you're not here to hate each other. You're here to do the job. Mm. And so there's a baseline level of professionalism, which is great. And I will say, like, I we don't hate each other. <laughs> we get along know. great. So it's been good, yeah. <laughs> well, another thing I, I love um, with your series is um, issue in issue 11, the most recent one that's come out, um, Ben is in a situation where he's trying to figure out how to solve the problem that he's in and what the mm-hmm. others on his team would do. In other words, um, uh, Johnny, Reed, um, Sue, what they would do in that current situation. I, what I found was fascinating about that dialogue it made me wonder the thing who, you know, he's super powerful. He's fought the Hulk. Uh, I mean, he's not as far as the Hulk. I think he's, he lost both of um, times he fought him. But the fact that he can stand up even close and not get killed is pretty impressive on, on his, you know, for him. The fact that he's mm-hmm. wondering what others would do to solve a problem, does is there does that? reveal a certain inadequacy that he feels maybe intellectually or creatively and how he would work as a solo individual. Yeah. One of the reasons I want to tell that story, um, one, cause I like the idea of being stuck in hold of the dogs. It happened to me, <laughs> but two, I feel like Ben is often sort of conceived of as this, uh, you know, a big bruiser, not that bright kind of guy, but he's a test mm. pilot. Like he's probably got a bastard's degree in something like he's not a he's not a dullard he's he's clever he's just surrounded by a bunch of geniuses and a fire guy <laughs> and so um i think for him he's just used to thinking well this is what i would do but you know why don't i ask the smartest man in the universe mm. who is standing to my left what he would do with this because he's probably gonna get it right like he's this brilliant guy and i feel like 
personally, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to surround myself with people who are smarter than me because then I get to feed off their brilliance and uh, steal their great ideas. And I feel like Ben is probably in the same place where he is used to not being the smartest guy, but he's also, he's no slouch. And right, right. he sort of asks himself, what would Reed do? What would Sue do? Even what would Johnny do? Just to check himself before he tries something to make sure that he's doing the right thing. And that I think speaks to the fact that they've been a team for, you know, 60 years of real world time, less in universe time, but he's got his, he's got his friends. He's got his friends and he's making sure he's having these little mental versions of them in, in his head to, check with them before he does stuff, which I think is speaking to the relationships. And I think that's kind of interesting too, is that when you look at the team, like you said, Reed Richard, probably the smartest man in the world. Uh, I'm not sure how Dr. Newman would feel about that as a, a label, <laughs> but it, 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 at the very least, he's in the conversation as smartest man, right? Yeah. Um, Sue Storm, over the years, they've made the Invisible Woman increasingly powerful. So she, you know, is super powerful at this point. Human Torch mm -hmm. is very powerful. Is thing in, in some level than the, the least powerful member of the group on, on some level? His powers are more straightforward, just as Ben himself is more straightforward. He is a strong, rocky guy with a heart of gold. And this, I would almost say mutation, but it's not. These powers he got from the cosmic rays, you now his are the only ones that can't turn off. Mm. His are the ones that, that that changed his life irrevocably uh, forever. And he's had to live with that. And he's made his peace with it. Mm. Um, especially at the end of Dan Slot's run, he had Ben say, I wouldn't change a thing, which is a cute and a pun and sweet. And so he's got the most like raw physical strength, but he doesn't have a lot of room for more subtle things like Sue can do with force fields or Johnny can do with fire. Mm. And so I think, again, like, there may be a little bit of uh, looking up to the people around me. Like they're so cool. They can do all this stuff. I can just, you know, punch really hard and get punched really hard. And maybe that's mm. not the greatest power to have, but it is, it's, he's such, he's so charismatic and it's so, it's so fun to have a guy that powerful on the team. I don't think he's, I don't really have a listing in my head of like, who's the strongest and who's the weakest. I think any list that puts Ben, the thing grim at the bottom of strength is one to be like, well, no, <laughs> he's so physically strong. But they are more straightforward powers for sure. Now, if we're going with the idea once again that he is, you know, as a master, probably as a master, probably really smart. Is there a danger in relying too much on the strength over the lot since he's become the thing? Um, and is that at all a problem for the character, or like for me as a writer? Uh, character or both? I mean, what was yeah. more interesting of a question for you? Make it more <laughs> make, the, make the question better. Yeah. Um, Ben is a guy who has struggled a lot, I think, with confidence. Um, not, I mean, publicly, he calls himself, you know, ever loving Aunt Petunia's favorite nephew. Like, he's always talking himself up. But then here's a guy who thinks he's a monster, who is surrounded by people who are smarter than him and have more uh, flexibility in their powers than him. And I think it's probably taken him a while to, like, except that he's got a lot to offer. He doesn't have to be the smartest guy. He doesn't even have to be the strongest guy. Like there's stuff in Ben that is great without the mm. powers. Um, but that's hard, I think. It's hard to find that, especially when everyone around you has gotten cooler, more charismatic powers, and you just think you're a monster. Like that, I'm not surprised it took him 60 years to figure <laughs> that out <laughs> and to be comfortable with it. Well, I mean, it's so interesting. I really do like in the issue that you do show that he's smart because he's he, uh, he's he's trying to figure out ways to measure the speed of things and kind of break mm -hmm. down how it works. I'm thinking to myself, it's kind of like you gave like this little science lesson <laughs> within the comic book. <laughs> I thought that is actually kind of incredible. I, re I remember, I, I I do believe I'm gonna hope I'm using the the the, the quote correct. I thought uh, my father who used to read comics growing up. His favorite comic book growing up was Fantastic mm -hmm. Four. Uh, and, oh, he, cool. and, he, and he yeah, and he tells me that a lot of what he knows about science came from reading the original uh, Fantastic Four stories because they would break into things about science and things of that nature. Now, really? Uh, yeah. So could you, you would credit Fantastic Four and some of those stories about sci-fi and how and some of his knowledge about how things actually function because that's what Stan Lee mm -hmm. would kind of throw in there. Now, are you continuing that tradition in in scenes like this where you're doing giving a little bit of an education and throwing a little bit more of science into Fantastic Four? Yeah, I am. Um, I think it's always cool when you can build something on actual science and science fiction, like 
pardon me, I'm a big fan of of like more harder sci-fi where you actually explain how things work. We don't get to that depth in Fantastic Four, obviously, but for me, it's a much more interesting comic and story if you can build it on something real mm. rather than build it on something made up. Mm. And it's an interesting line because like the phrase comic book science exists and it's used to describe something that does not have any basis in reality. It's just fantasy stuff. A shrink ray is comic book science. And we are in this comic book world. Like it is fantastic for they do invent hover cars and all this literally fantastic machinery. And so it's kind of a trick to have it grounded. Um, but I think I found the way to sort of thread that needle where we do have actual science at the heart of these stories. And if you can learn something from it, that's great. I don't want it ever to be like didactic and a homework lesson, but I'm I'm really happy here that your your father was like learning science through these books. And I'm hoping the people who will read this book, oh, maybe I'll look in, you know, I'll look up what mirror life is or what a potato tube is or like all these stuff that we use in the books um, that does exist and you can can research. My favorite example of that is uh, in issue six, I believe, Sue Storm, slight spoilers for issue six, uh, blocks out the sun for Earth, which is terrific and cool. Yeah. And I saw someone, maybe they messaged me being like, you know, this would never work because everyone would freeze. And I was like, aha. I have a paper on this because there were some researchers uh, who were doing earth simulation and it takes a lot of computation. It takes days to run results come out and they realized they forgot to turn the sun on in their simulation. <laughs> so oh, no. been cooling for three weeks in this virtual world. And they write a paper on that instead of like, if the sun disappeared, here's what happened. <laughs> and so I have like actual scientific research I can point to, to be like, yeah, the earth, like I said in the comic, the Earth's magma, the core has a lot of heat that would dissipate. The rocks are warm. And since we're only doing a like a three, four state area in that comic, this would work. This would not be as catastrophic as you might think. <laughs> um, it would take months for the oceans to freeze if we turned mm. off the sun today, which is, I, mean, I think that's really cool. The fact that we can point to actual numbers of if the sun just disappeared, what happens next? Mm. That's always a fun thing to think about. And being able to sort of build a story on that Mm. even though it could very easily just be comic book science when it's realer i think it's it's much cooler to play with well i mean that's why i think comics are just fantastic and i can't remember exactly the details of of what i was I read here as well but it's one of the lines of when they when you kids are reading com comic books versus books for the normal age group i think i read there's more unique words they pick out in a comic book than in the normal book they read at that age group mm. uh which well, you kinda, have two chances Right. <laughs> I mean, interrupted you. But yeah, you've, you've got two chances in comics. If you don't get the word, you have the context of the images to help explain it to you. And, and it's such a great educational tool. So is that even something, like I said, that's something you're thinking about as you're writing, thinking about? Because um, Fast Forward, I think, especially the series, feels like it's more aged for everybody to, to enjoy yep. versus, once again, um, let's say Spawn, which you're not giving Spawn, ho hopefully not to your... Uh, you know, ten year old be like, "Hey, read Spawn." <laughs> Probably not. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm trying. Um, I mean, Squirrel Girl was explicitly all ages, so kids can read it, adults can read it. Fantastic Four. Uh, I think it skews a little bit older, but I'm not trying to like close the door on people. So I want it to be a book that you can hand to, you know, a precocious six-year-old or an interested 10-year-old or mm. your friend who's 42 and they'll be like oh cool this book doesn't talk down to me and there's some neat stuff in here like this is mm. this is a cool sci-fi story with people with fantastic powers who like each other and also irritate each other <laughs> <laughs> well obviously in, in in the most recent issue of fantastic four um there was a um a major uh, introduction um significant is the dog uh, mm -hmm. which let's face it, a dog being introduced in any story is significant because everyone loves dogs. Uh, um, so is, is this something that's going to stay? Is was this a cute moment for the story, or is this some a character that's going to be staying in for a while? Yeah, Princess the dog will uh, be there. She hasn't had. I'm I'm pretty far ahead. I'm working on issue nineteen now, maybe twenty, and that was issue eleven. So um. I can tell you that she's in future story. She doesn't have like the star role. She does in this one. This was her big, big introduction. But uh, yeah, Ben Grimm has a dog named Princess. Cute little white lap dog. <laughs> it's going to be great. I don't know if you just gave away a bit of a spoiler because in the issue 11, they don't tell you the dog's name yet. I don't believe. 
Uh, they do at the very last page. Uh, ben says, I'm, I'm sure she'll tell us her name sometime. And then the title is uh, Ben Grimm and Princess Masters Grimm in It's Slavering Time. Oh, I missed that. I missed that little yeah. part. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I slipped it in there. You're not the only one. People are like, what's the doc's name? I'm like, read the last page. Read the title of the story. It's right there. God damn it. I'm, I'm, I got to go back and look at it. Because I was like, uh-oh, you, did, you gave away something. I was like, oh, you did, though. It's in no, there. Okay. It's there. Oh, <laughs> it's in I, the text. I, I was about to do like posted spoiler we have a name of the dog exclusive (laughs) name of the dog and that probably would be um somehow the most popular episode i had was because the dog had a name (laughs) i I spent a long time trying to name that dog with different different options what it could be now obviously um i'm sure the mystery is gonna be partly is this really just a dog hmm or is there something more because once again because the world comic books the always question is is a dog just a dog or is this a dog that's now a celestial. I mean, is there, where are we going with the dog? I see you've read my notes. <laughs> um, for me, and I mean, future writers can always change this. Yeah. But my conception, I think it's interesting to have the dog be a dog mm. in, a, in a family with, with superpowers. Um, it's just a regular dog who likes them. And I, I, I realize I have a soft spot in my uh, creative heart for that like the the main relationship in squirrel girl was doreen green squirrel girl and nancy whitehead her roommate with no powers they become very very close in that Mm -hmm. story and in the fantastic four uh it's basically fantastic five because alicia is up there with all the others as a major part of the uh, main character in the book and alicia doesn't have any powers and i you know it's the same superman and lois Lois and Jimmy don't have any powers. Like it's, mm. I I think there's a lot of interesting stories you can tell when you have a superpowered person and a non-superpowered person. And also I've already got four superpowered people. You add in the kids, you've got almost another four <laughs> to varying degrees of superpowers at different times. I think the dog can just be a cute dog who's there because she likes hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, what can our listeners look forward to in the upcoming issues of Fantastic Four? Oh, gosh. Um, issue 12 and 13 is a two-part story with dinosaurs. Ooh. Uh, with, I think, the best cover of Alex Ross's career, which is uh, showing Dr. Doom riding a T-Rex, who is also Dr. Doom, and wearing Dr. Doom armor. Uh, <laughs> That's insane. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm constantly floored by the fact that I can think of something so awesome and so stupid as that <laughs> then Alex <laughs> Ross paints it and they put it on the cover of the book like it feels like I'm getting away with something um and I can also tease a little bit that um when the story started in issue one the Baxter building had disappeared with the kids inside of it and that was going to take a year to get the back and we're coming up on about a year of story time so Who's to say what will happen next? It sounds absolutely awesome. Mr. North, it's been a total pleasure. And thank you for making a great comic book. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for giving <laughs> me such a, a praised, uh, praiseworthy exit. I appreciate it. <laughs> you too. Cheers.